All right, here we go. How's everyone doing? Awesome. Hey, everyone, my name is Eric Bucci. I'm the lead pastor here. And if this is your first time joining with us today or if your first time online, we want to welcome you. Thank you so much for, for being our guest and being here today. And if you been, haven't been to church in a long time, we want to invite you. If you're at the beach or you're in the backyard weed whacking, it's a lot better being here than weed whacking, right? So, so we want to welcome everyone that's watching in line for the first time or here for the first time. Let them know how much better it is in person. Nice and loud, everybody. <laughs> All right. Well, everybody, we have uh, small groups that are starting again this summer. Uh, we spend a lot more emphasis in the, in the fall, in the winter. We recognize in the summer people have a lot of things that are going on. So we have a little more of an abbreviated section of that. But there's still opportunities. And also Serve Day is coming up. Where we're going to go through our communities and we're going to serve uh, our communities from various things. you have any ideas, you can go to... Uh, office at cornerstonecheshire.com, and we want to be able to help our communities during Serve Day as well. That's what's going on, okay? We're in a series called the Sermon on the Mount, and next week we're going to begin a new series within a series, like a dream within a dream, and we're going to talk about prayer in greater detail. Today we're starting about prayer and fasting. How many of you like prayer and fasting? You love prayer and fasting, right? You, yeah, you, you love it. You love it. Well, in, in the United States of America, I'd say right now, people, a lot of folks say this. When a tragedy happens, our what? Our thoughts and our prayers are with you. And people really get irritated about that. I don't want to hear about your thoughts and prayers. I want to see action. There you go. And so, yeah, there's something to be said about that. But people are ridiculed for prayer. What good does prayer do? But I think everyone prays. Even atheists pray. I heard of an atheist actually said this one time. I was talking to an atheist. He says, I thank God. I don't believe in God. <laughs> so there's, there's no way around it. And, and so a lot of people say that. And for us, it's often, and for us that are believers, sometimes it's like, let's just get through the preliminaries so we can get on to what we need to get on to. It's almost like having a national anthem at a football game or a baseball game. Hey, let's just get through it so we can get back into what we nearly, nearly need to be doing. Or let's have a prayer so we can have our meeting. Or let's quickly have a prayer so we can go ahead and get through the meal or this or the other. And, and, and so many times it gets that way. And the truth be told, many people fear praying out loud. In fact, in the last service, I asked this question. How many of you rather die than get up and pray in public? And a couple of hands went up. People get afraid of praying. Now, I'm going to ask this question. How many of you fear death less than getting up in front of people and speaking? Okay, you guys are a more spiritual crowd than the first service. Give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> so a lot of folks are afraid to pray. Well, what is prayer about? And, and Jesus is speaking. He's going to be talking about how not to pray. Sometimes how, knowing how not to do something is helpful to show you how to pray. And prayer is such an important part that God is calling us to do. But many of us struggle with prayer. In fact, I want to show you a little example of how awkward it can be when you want to pray, especially when you're going to meet your future parents. Greg, would you like to say grace? Oh, uh, well, uh, Greg's Jewish dad. You know that. You're telling me the Jews don't pray, honey? Unless you have some objection. No, 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 I'd love to. Pam, come on, it's not like I'm a rabbi or something. I said grace in many a dinner table. It's... Okay. Oh, dear God, thank you. You are such a good God to us, a, a kind and gentle and accommodating God. And we thank you, oh, sweet, sweet Lord of hosts, for the smorgasbord you have so aptly lain at our table this day and each day by day. Day by day, by day. Oh, dear Lord, three things we pray. 
to love thee more dearly, to see thee more clearly, to follow thee more nearly, day by day, by day. Amen. Amen. Oh, Greg, that was lovely. Thank you, Greg. That was interesting, too. <laughs> Okay, I think a lot of us have experienced something like that where we have to pray in front of somebody. We don't know what to say. We say the wrong thing. You're worried about it. And it becomes almost like a rote, some religious activity that we have to do. You got to pray. And let's be truthful. If I were to call a prayer meeting, everyone, if I ask you right now, what's the most important thing we do? Oh, we need to be a, a church of prayer. Prayer is important. But yet, if you invite people to our prayer meeting, very few people show up. Why is that? Well, I think part of the reason, people are afraid they're going to be asked to pray. Have you ever sat in a circle with somebody, and you're holding hands, and all of a sudden you have to scratch your nose? You know what I'm talking about? You're like, <laughs> it's just awkward, right? What am I supposed to say? And it's, it's nerve-wracking, and I don't know what to say. I, I struggle with prayer. Prayer is such a difficult thing for me to do, and I don't know how to do it. And a lot of people struggle with that. So we're going to look how you and I can learn to pray effective prayers that move the hand of God. How many of you folks want to be able to pray yeah. effective prayers that please God and move the hand of God? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Amen. And so God calls us to be a people of prayer. Jesus was a person of prayer. And so we're going to look at it today. But for, before we do that, I want to go ahead and just read through it. We're going to read through two sections uh, here in chapter 6. The one section we talked about last week about giving. Today, we're going to talk about praying and fasting. So we're going to read it through, and then we're going to go line by line, verse by verse. Here we go. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Surely, I say to you that they have their reward. But when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door... Pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. And when you fast... Do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that, they, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So we're talking about praying. Last week, we talked about giving and how we ought to do everything we do for an audience of one. And we mentioned last week, one of the most miserable things that you and I can do is try to please people. It is an impossible feat. But if you say, I want to please God and please Him only, how much better is that? I want to please God. I don't have to try to please everyone else, but I want to please God. I want to give my life to God. I want to do things that make God happy. And how much better is that? So we do it for an audience of one. We mentioned last week. And we also mentioned last week, this kind of sets up this whole section, is this, beware of practicing your righteousness, like doing the right stuff, right, before other people in order to be seen by them. Oh, you're such a godly person. For then you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Yes, God has rewards. They're not like credit card rewards. Rewards by God is an amazing thing. When God says, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into my joy today, and God will reward us. I don't know if you recognize this, but heaven is not some white mist in the cloud with a bunch of naked cherubim playing, uh, playing harps, and you're bored to death. Heaven in a new kingdom eventually one day is going to be an incredible place where you and I will get to do incredible things, and God will reward us. Based upon what we do. In fact, Jesus even says that I have a reward for you. And the book of Hebrews reminds us of that. It says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You see, when we're praying, we believe God hears our prayers. And he is a rewarder 
of those who diligently seek him. And so here Jesus is going to be talking about a couple of different ways. Some of them is the religious crowd of the day called the Pharisees and how they prayed. And then he's going to talk about how non-pharisaical or the quote-unquote pagans, non-Jewish people pray. And setting the record straight, this is how you are to pray. So he will actually show, his, show us, we're going to go through the Lord's Prayer next week. We'll be talking about that on for Father's Day, our Father who art in heaven. Before we do that, he tells us how to pray and how not to pray. I just want to remind you, last week we gave an illustration. We talked about two types of trees that you and I can climb in our faith. One of the things we want to do is the tree of influence. I want to be influential. I want to be known. And everything I do, I want to be seen. And we climb that to be known by people, to make a name for ourselves. And the higher you go, the more brittle the branches are and the greater the fall is. Or we can climb the tree like Zacchaeus, we mentioned last week, got out of the tree of influence and got into the tree of pleasing God. And how much better is it, everybody, when we do things to please God? When I'm pleasing God, who cares about anybody else and what they think? And you know how freeing that is? You know how much anxiety passes away from us? You know how much worry goes away when I really don't make, I really don't care what other people think because I care what God thinks. Now, God loves people, so I care what other people are going through. But ultimately, my aim and your aim should be to love God and, and to enjoy Him forever. I mean, that's so much better. How simple is that, everybody? It's a beautiful thing that God would have us to do. So we mentioned that. So this week and when you pray. It doesn't say if you pray. It says when you pray. When you speak to God. Well, how do we pray? How many of you ever known anybody that you call on the phone? I have a friend like this. And if, if I ever called him on the phone or meet in person, I, probably 98%, I'm not even exaggerating, out of an hour conversation, I might get in two paragraphs. <laughs> Actually, it's kind of nice when I don't feel like talking. I just, and it's very entertaining. I, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And what do you think about that? One time, I, I, I was talking to somebody, and I literally put the phone down and went downstairs, got something out of the refrigerator, and came back up. And, mm-hmm. <laughs> so if I ever go, mm-hmm, and it makes no sense, I went to the refrigerator. <laughs> but, but sometimes we talk, talk. Now, is that really talking? It, it, if you never listen, is that talking? No, it's a monologue. We're just dropping a list off. God wants us to have communication with him. That you can communicate with a God of all the universe through Jesus Christ. And when you pray, how are you to pray? This is what he says. Prayer must be done regularly. It's something that we should do all the time. In fact, it says in the Bible, pray without ceasing. What are you kidding me? Am I supposed to be on the floor of my house all day long praying? No, it's a prayerful state. For example, when I go on a walk with my wife or, or, or on a car ride, I'll be with Sandra, and we don't talk the whole time, but we're with each other. We're holding each other's hand. We're walking down the road, or we're driving down the road. Both hands are on the wheel, though. I would tell you that. Okay, so that's just what's happening. And, and then we may not talk for 25, 35 minutes or so, but we're there. Oh, look at that. And her presence is there with me, and we speak. And we, we, ha- we have a consciousness that we're around, like a God consciousness. It sounds like a new age thing. I have a God consciousness. But just this sense that God is around and God is with you wherever you go. He says, I'll never leave you even until the end of the age. So God is always around us. So we often ask for his manifest presence. God, I want to know you're near. And he's near us. But l- let me say something else very important about prayer. What relationship can remain healthy without communication? I don't know of any relationship of any kind of value, of any kind of intimacy that can, can last or be healthy without communication. And this has happened maybe in some of your marriages where maybe you don't talk to your husband or wife for a little bit. You get busy and you kind of miss each other and you go to bed, she gets up and this weeks go on. What happens? You start misunderstanding each other. Then you start losing that, that intimacy feeling. Like, I don't think I know this person anymore. Communication is very important especially with God. And so that's why it's very important. This is for all relationships, by the way. You literally have to get your calendar open and say, I need to have communication with my spouse, my children, my friends. I need to actually put it in my calendar to make sure that I, that's legalism. No, it's not. It's that important that you have communication, especially with God. I, I don't know how to communicate with God. It's intimi- it is intimidating. Yet it doesn't have to be. Prayer must be done regularly all the time. 
And it's a wonderful thing that God can teach us to do. And he shows us how to do it. And when you pray, you should not be like the hypocrites. Hypocrites are acting like something they're not. They're trying to put a charade on. They act like they love God, but really it's not about that. Or how about this? Or you will actually pray. And you're not praying to yourself, but you're like that man who's praying to his future father-in-law. I want to be seen and heard by other people. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. And often it was three times a day. Some scholars say nine, 12, and three. Others say 12, three, and six. I'm not quite sure, but the Pharisees would do it three times a day. And they would go and they walk to the temple. And as they go, oh, Father God in heaven, I bless you. And they'd walk down the street and they would, they would just have all this wonderful um, parade of religiosity. In fact, I was reading also that what they would often do is they would pray something that Shema, if I say it correctly, which consists of three short passages is, Hear, O Israel, our Lord God is one. And they would quote that. And the earlier they could do it, the better you were. So if you can get it before the day begins, you want to say it the first thing in the morning. So it became about if I'm really a good Christian or a good Jewish person, I got to do this, 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 and the other. And then they'd also have these 18 types of prayers they would pray as well, these beautiful short prayers. And there's nothing wrong with prayer books. There's nothing wrong with going through some sort of systems. Systems are fine if they deliver you intimacy with the Father. But if the systems become the end game, it's, what good is that? It's like going on a date so you can check it off. Okay, we went on a date. No, it's the date, the time with God is to meet with God not just to check it off. So don't, you should not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and, oh, Father God in heaven. You know, I, I know sometimes people, I don't know why people have to pray in King James. Lord, we beseech thee. I mean, who talks that way, right? And so, and, and sometimes you can see like a pastor like myself pray. I can never do that. And we never want you to feel that way. You can pray. And we're going to talk about what that looks like just in a little bit. So they pray in the synagogues that they may be seen by men. And God says, I'm not impressed with that. Surely I say to you, they have their reward. If you want the applause of men, you'll never have the applause of God. So I want to be able to communicate with God. I want to be able to communicate with God in a powerful way. So prayer must also be done sincerely. Uh, Can you imagine uh, if I were going to talk to Sandra and I said, Oh, dearest thou Sandra. From the depths of the bowels of my intestines. <laughs> I want to let you know that I love you with an everlasting effervescence of grace and love. And I tell you with everything I have. And, and I mean, who would, talk, who would pray like that, right? She might actually like that. Actually, I should try it. Because our anniversary is coming up. We're going to be married 22 years. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's nothing wrong, but no one talks that way to somebody. You talk normally to somebody. Now, you want to give God honor, right? But why do we have to get all flowery like that? And like, I can't do that. You don't have to do that. God wants us to communicate. Prayer must be done sincerely, not in pretense. And and it says in Mark 12, 38, and this is a parallel passage that talks a little bit about the Pharisees, says this. And in his teaching, he said, beware of the scribes. Who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplace. Oh, hi, hi, Rabbi. And have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at feast. Who devours widows' houses for a pretense, make long prayers. You see, these quote unquote evangelists that take advantage of the, of the least of these to get money has been happening all through the Old Testament, even now. But why do they do it for? Because they want pretense. They want to get things for themselves, and they will receive the greater condemnation. So God is not impressed with that. If we're trying to, imp- it actually makes God nauseous when we try to act all spiritual to other people and we don't care about Him. That's not a thing that God wants us to do. He wants us to be genuine. He wants us to, to be sincere. What relationship has any value if you believe the person is being insincere with you? You want that intimacy where you're talking how you feel. So prayer must be done regularly. must be done sincerely. Prayer must be done secretly. I mean, the most intimate conversations I've ever had. Has this ever happened to you? Hey, can I talk to you privately for a moment? By the way, have you learned this yet? I've learned this. Let me give you a little bit of advice. 
If your spouse calls you or something like that, immediately say, if you're on speakerphone, I'm on speakerphone. Because my wife says such wonderful things about me, you don't want to hear it. But seriously, uh, uh, can I talk to you privately? Come here, I want to talk to you privately. And you'll share things with somebody. In fact, the, the people I'm closest to, I'll share my heart, how I feel, what I think, what I'm going through. That intimacy, intimacy happens by yourself with somebody, right? The same with God. Going to that secret place. Prayer must be done secretly. It's not about anybody else. God, it's about you and me. In fact, if you pray more publicly than secretly, then something's wrong. Something's wrong. But when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to the Father who is in the secret place. In the, in the Greek word, their secret place. And many people in antiquity, what they would have, they would have a room, an area of the home where they would put the things that were secret, maybe the, the jewels or the gold or the pearls or necklaces, what have you. They would be in that secret place like a safe bolted to the ground like we would have today. It's in that secret place that you would meet with God where no one sees it. It's precious to you. There was a great movie. I actually liked it. It's called War Room. I don't know if you've seen it, uh, where it's a woman's praying for the loved one. She's got this, like, this closet, and she prays. And, and, and it's just, do you have that secret place where you can be alone with God? I, I know I love coming to this church when no one is here. I love it. I can just kind of raise my voice and, and pray and walk around. If someone's around, I feel kind of odd about it, and I have to get by myself. I just like, I personally... I like to be in a secret place when I'm talking to God uh, about things that are really on my heart. And, and incidentally, it's not just talking. Now, I know when we have public prayers, we're talking out loud. We don't have time for two-way prayer as much, though we do listen. But a conversation with God can be really quiet. And I think sometimes in our traditions, we, we've lost the art of listening prayer or abiding prayer. And for me personally, I, I love going in nature. And just sitting there over a vista, looking at the, looking at the air, I mean, looking at the birds fly by and all that, and, and just, just noticing God's beauty and just saying, God, thank you. Lord, I just pray you would show me what is it that you want me to. Lord, search my heart. God, is there anything in me? I just be quiet and just wait and listen. Now, if you're like me, you probably wait and listen. Whoa, oh, oh. <laughs> Sometimes, listen, you don't have to close your eyes and fold your hands. Nowhere in the scripture does it say close your eyes and fold your hands. Do you know why they do that for? So you're not fiddling around and you're not looking around. The other day at the men's group, a friend of mine, we kept looking at this chipmunk. We're trying to do the Bible study and we keep looking at the chipmunks outside. Uh, so that's why we close our eyes. Squirrel. Okay. I mean, I saw a bobcat out there one time. It's a good crap. We have a lot of wildlife out there. Turtles deer, has nothing to do with the sermon, except for the fact that you can get distracted, and that's why we close our eyes and fold our hands, but it doesn't mean you have to do that, okay? So go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. You see, when, when I have a good conversation and I have a good relationship with my wife, Sandra, we can be in a, in a party, and I can just look at her and go, and she knows exactly, she'll give me that look, a good look. And I know what she's saying. Why? Because we're in communication all the time. The more we communicate, the greater our relationship is, the more intimacy we have, the healthier we are. Same with God. God wants you to pray without ceasing. So prayer must be done regularly, must be done sincerely, prayer must be done secretly, and prayer must be done relationally. We just talked about this. It's a relationship. It's not a duty, it's a delight. But... If you don't make time, it will not happen. The enemy will do anything he can. He may not get you to, to get involved with sin, but he, what he'll do, he'll have you do a bunch of good things. He'll have you call somebody, and you can start helping everyone else. And this has happened to me, where I'll start helping everyone else in the church, and I ignore my own kids. Or I'll talk to everyone else. Like my dad, again, they learn this. One time, my mother told my father, can I have an appointment with you? Because you're talking to everyone else but me. I mean, you, sometimes you have to actually make times with God. Appointments. And I would suggest to do it early in the morning. Jesus would go to the secret place. 
He would go early in the morning in a quiet, lonely place. Jesus would go to that secret place. Do you have a secret place? Do you have a special restaurant you like to go with your loved one? And I got my little secret place in the basement when no one's home and this ratty old couch that Sandra's been asking for the last five years to get rid of. But I always make an excuse. Why waste the money? It's ratty. I went to Haiti and I saw the same couch in Haiti. That's how bad. <laughs> it was in an orphanage in the woods. It was a terror now. I said, well, they have the same couch as we have. <laughs> but you got to have that place. I love going in my car. I do. I love being in my car, praying in my car. It's fantastic because i got it four walls around me, and I can just, it's just wonderful. But prayer must be done relationally. That's what it's all about, everybody. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions. Father God, 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 I thank you for this, Father God. And Father God, we ask it. No, no, don't use vain repetitions. Or, you know, like the Buddhists would do, they have a little prayer wheel. And sometimes even in the church, listen, I'm not trying to come against our Catholic friends because we do it here as well. Lord, we thank you for this food. We bless it to our bodies in Jesus' name. How many times do we do that so we can eat? Hurry up and pray so we can eat. I've been guilty of that, Right? Or how about saying, you know, I got okay, I want you to do this. I want you to do four Hail Marys, two Lord's Prayers, and throw an Apostle Creed just to make me happy. You know, and, and we say these things, and, and if we say them rote and rote, what does it mean? Cantations? Where we're trying to say enough of these things to get God to hear us and to whip ourselves, to beat ourselves up, like they do in the Philippines on, on Good Friday, what they'll do sometimes, they'll they'll put themselves on cross with surgical steel, trying to make God happy, trying to beat themselves up and trying to get God's attention. Is that what you would do? Can you imagine your child doing that to me? Mom and Dad, speak to me. What? And they're hitting themselves with a fist. Would you like that? Of course not. You want a relationship with them, right? So vain repetitions, it's not about that. It's about speaking normally with somebody. Speaking normally to somebody. And so that's what the heathen do. They think that they will be heard from their many words. I don't want to do that. Therefore, do not be like them. For your father knows the things you have need for before you ask him. Then why do we bother to ask? If God is going to do what God's going to do when he's going to do it, then why bother to ask? Why? Because God, first of all, it's true that prayer changes us. But prayer also changes changes what God will do and will not do. It's not all prearranged and you can't help it. No, there is a God's will that's in flux. There's God's sovereign wills that are not going to change, but there's an area he puts, a nebula, if you will, this area of flux where literally if you pray, God will. And so we can see it through Scripture, through Moses and through the New Testament. You can see that if you pray, Jesus says, keep knocking, keep asking. Don't give up on prayer. I've seen it, everybody. Don't give up praying for your loved ones. Every prayer that you pray that says in the book of, of Revelation, he collects them in gold bowls. And I believe there's a big, big thing in heaven one day. Some of you are praying for your grandchildren, your children. And even after you die, your prayers are still in the account of heaven. I don't understand it completely, but God works in partnership with us to see heaven release. But we need to pray. Not to manipulate God, but to be in communion with God, to work with God. God wants us to work in communion with him, a partnership. So the Father knows what we have. So I don't need to tell God, God, I just want to let you know what's going on at home. He knows already. I said to go, God, you know what's going on in our country right now. Lord, I don't know how on earth you don't judge America based upon what we're doing. Father, I'm frustrated with our culture right now. Lord, give me a heart that you have towards our culture. Lord, give me hope to see what you want to see. And sh God, you know, I'm a little concerned because, you know, Luke's going to college. We're going to miss not having him around. You know, just tell God how I feel. Tell him how you feel, right? He knows what you need ahead of time. And so I want to encourage you to do that. You know, I was just reading a story uh, a little while ago where there was this man on the park bench, and he was hands in his in his in his face, and he was crying and sobbing, and, and a young boy comes up to him and says, Sir, what seems to be your problem? He says, My brother's incarcerated. He's going to be, going to be executed, and he's not, he's, he's not, it's a false charge, and I don't know what to do. I wanted to see, I wanted to see, um, I wanted to see Abraham Lincoln, but I can't get into the White House, and he's the only one that can pardon him, and I don't know what to do, and I wish I could get him somehow. The boy says, Come here, come with me. The little boy took him through the gate, through the Secret Service, Secretary of Defense, Right into the office of the president. Said, Dad, 
this man has a concern. He needs to speak to you. And so the man had his case heard before the president because of the president's son. You see, through Jesus Christ, we have direct access to God. Not because you're a great person, I'm a great person. It's because Jesus has mercy on us. He sees us. He takes our hand, and he takes us right before the Father. That's why we say, in Jesus' name. I think that's probably one of the biggest things we flip off our tongues. In Jesus' name, Jesus' name. You know what Jesus' name means? In Jesus' purpose, in Jesus' name, is powerful. Right? And so, Lord, in... In Jesus' name. So be careful. I don't want to just say Jesus' name flippantly. Father knows the things you have before you even ask him. So we are to do that. So we are to pray. And we also, prayer must be done publicly. I thought it was supposed to be done privately. Why is it publicly? Well, I heard of a, a, a young boy around Christmas time. He was praying in the living room. And Father God, I pray you would give me that yellow bicycle with the banana seat. Oh, Lord, I thank you that you hear my prayer. And his mother goes to him, what's your problem? Why are you yelling at the top of your lungs about your bicycle? God knows what you need. Yeah, God does, but Grandma knows exactly how much it will cost. So I want to make sure she knows about it. (laughs) We're like that little boy sometimes. I want to be seen as a leader. I'm spiritual. I've been guilty of it. And sometimes even I'll, I'll even like, you know, preach a sermon. Pastor Granger, thank you so much. No, I, I pray that when we walk out of here, you may say, well, Pastor, thank you for sharing the word. It helped me see God clearer. I hope that's the case. That it's not just, oh, I enjoyed that. Because that, that's vain, right? So prayer must be done publicly. In fact, Jesus, I mean, the reason why we have prayers in the Bible is to teach us to pray. There's nothing wrong with praying out loud if it's done with the right reason and it stands as a model for us to pray. This is why Jesus in John chapter 17 gives a priestly prayer for his disciples, including us today. It's a beautiful prayer. You can hear his prayer. How do we have all the prayers in the Bible? Because they prayed out loud. So it's okay to pray out loud. And silently. But there has to be a secret place heart when you pray out loud. Does that make sense, everybody? So that's part of it as well. I desire, therefore, men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without doubting. So it talks about lifting up holy hands and praying. Also, I like what Tony Evans says. He says this, Prayer is a believer's communication with God through the person of Christ, assisted by the work of the Holy Spirit. I think he sums it up very well. Very well. And and that's what really prayer is. Now we get to fasting. Everyone loves to fast. And when you fast, I don't know why they call it fast. I like to drive fast, but I don't like to fast. Right? And when you fast, not eating, this is what he says about it. Do not look gloomy like the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. And I was reading that in these commentaries that on Mondays and Thursdays was the marketplace in Jerusalem. And so those were the days the Pharisees would choose to fast when all the food's coming in and all the, all the produce is coming in. And they'd walk through the streets. Oh, what are you doing? I'm fasting. Oh, this is so difficult. I'm fasting for Jesus. <laughs> you know, you go through all this, and I'm suffering for you. I'm fasting, and, and then they would put a big show on. And this is what they would do. They would fast on those days when the marketplace happened. And no, don't be like gloomy like the hypocrites. The Bible says, for the what is my strength? For the joy of the Lord is my strength. For they disfigure their faces, that their fast they may be seen by others. Oh, I'm on a 21-day fast. <laughs> Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward Two men, this is a a parable Jesus talks about. Two men went into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, which is the conservative church of the day, the godly, biblical, sound theologian of the day. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. If you're not familiar with tax collectors, we talk about them a lot. They were Jewish people that were hired by the Roman government to tax their own people, and they would take off money and and pocket it for themselves at their countryman's expense. They were loathed. They were hated. So Jesus is using this example of a Pharisee. Like, well, this, this is it. And a scum of the earth, okay? The Pharisee standing by himself, praying thus, God, I thank you 
that I'm not like the other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. We are biblical here at Cornerstone Church. You know, like that. I fast twice a week. I give tithes to all that I get. Now, that's good, right? But look what he says. But the tax collector, standing afar off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, which was a sign of great mourning, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And you would think in that day, God wouldn't hear that jerk. You'd hear the Pharisee. No, what Jesus says, I tell you this, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So when we fast, what we want to do is we want to focus on God. I just want to share a few things about that. When you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others. You don't have to walk around, oh, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fasting. It's miserable. No, be quiet. If you fast, don't tell anybody, unless you want to be an example to somebody. But sometimes it's best just to be quiet and do your work, unto, do it unto the Lord. All right? That, it'd be seen by others. But your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. It's not about that. And how much better is that? And I'm going to say something else about this. You may not like this, but if you're afraid to pray in public, Or you love to pray in public because people see what a godly prayer you are. Do you realize that both had the same problem? And what's that? The fear of man. If I'm afraid to pray in front of other people, they might not like my prayer. Who cares? If God is pleased, what difference does it make? Sometimes people that are fearful of doing something that other people are doing criticize them but they're the same spirit, the fear of man, and the, the desire to please man motivates both people, including the Pharisee. I'm, I'm telling you right now. So, don't, I understand, you're human beings, and public speaking is one of the fearful things in the world for a lot of people, but it's for God. It's not for people. I understand that. So he says, don't be seen that way. But the Father in secret, he sees in secret, rewards you openly. So fasting, in a way, is a feasting time. It's to close down the other areas of my life and focus that attention on God. And often there can be prayer and fasting. Maybe you're praying for a lost one or a loved one, or maybe you're praying to get over something or for more clarity. There's something powerful when you fast and you pray. And what you do is you kind of tone down the world and you want to tune up your spirit this way. It doesn't mean that you're on a hunger fast. It doesn't mean you're burning mattresses in the prison to get the prison warden to let you out. No, you're not trying to make God happy. It's nothing to do with moving God. It's to get yourself in a place to hear greater because we have a lot of different competing distractions in our lives. And I want to encourage you, if you want to hear God, how about we shut these, these things off? Shut it off. Shut it off. And, and, and spend time with the Lord. I, God, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to eat until I hear from you. There was a time where I used to get so busy during seminary. I was so busy. I wasn't spending time with the Lord. So I said, God, I'm not going to eat until I spend quality, unrushed time with you. And I lost 15 pounds. <laughs> I'm going to write a book. You heard of the South Beach diet? Yeah. This is called the Bucci diet. It works, sort of. Okay, fasting is a way of feasting. I'm going to feast on the Lord. And maybe you have medical condition. It's not about that. It's about tuning your spirit into God. And food, let's be honest, food's a powerful thing. Refrigerators speak to you. Oh, it does. Hey, you've been ignoring me. Yeah. What? Who's that? Me, the refrigerator. <laughs> okay, so it speaks to you. So it's best to kind of, it, there's a time to do that. Also, and, and live for the glory of God. It's not about me. I want to see God glorified. And also, keep it real. Stop being fake. Is there enough fake out there, everybody? Why don't we just become real, real in what we're doing? And I want to encourage you with these things today as we conclude our time. So what are three ways to give? 
pray and fast. Again, these are three things that Jesus talks about in this passage. They have similar structure patterns and how he talks about being seen by men, being seen by people. We mentioned this last week. I want to kind of wrap this up before we get into our series on the Lord's Prayer next week. And it's this. Be congratulated by man. Is that what you want? If you've done that, you've lost it all. We mentioned last week, I mentioned again, be congratulated by self. Well, I'll say self, what a great person I am. No. And the man said to himself, I have many, many provisions. I'll say to myself, I can retire. You fool, your life will be required of you tonight. You see, when we congratulate ourselves, you know, I'm not telling anyone else, but if you think you're all that, no. Be congratulated by man or by yourself or be congratulated by God. I want to live for the applause of God, for an audience of one in giving. Well, I'm going to trust God. God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to tithe and I'm going to give. I've been doing it all my life. And I've seen God to be faithful. I didn't get all my greeds, but I sure have gotten all my needs met. It's been supernatural. It's been absolutely supernatural as I've trust God. In fact, as a church, I'm, I'm, God is calling us to do even more than we've ever done before. We're going to believe God to plant several, hopefully two or three churches before this year ends. You know, we're going to give more money away and help more people locally, internationally. And this is what I've found. I've found if we're benevolent as a church, God meets the needs of our church supernaturally. So I do it, we do it as a church. And I encourage you to trust God in your giving, in your prayer, in your fasting. It should be done as a worship to God. And watch what God will do. You see, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. As we read before, for he or she who comes to God must believe that he is a, that he is, excuse me, that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. When you and I pray, it takes faith. You see, my question to you as the worship team makes their way up, do you have faith in Jesus Christ? Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? God has no obligations to you unless you go through the sun. It's like that man on a park bench. You can have a lot of wishes, but unless you have the sun, you cannot go to the Father. Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? Yes. He's the one that died on the cross for us, took our place, paid our debts, and that we can boldly go into the throne of grace. Dad, I have someone that wants to talk to you because of what Jesus has done. Let me ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment. I want to ask you a question that if you were to die, we ask this question all the time because it's a good question to ask and a good test. If you were to die right now, do you absolutely positively know you'd be with Jesus forever? And if you say, I'm not quite sure, but compared to everyone else, that doesn't cut it. Jesus told the man on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. It's not what you've done, it's what you've surrendered. Jesus loves you and he's come to give you access to the Father. But it's only through believing that he died on the cross, rose again from the dead. And then the most important part after that is this, that we would surrender our lives to Jesus. It's called surrender. So if you'd like to give your life to Christ, maybe you've never done that before. Maybe you used to walk with God and you've walked away. You've been disappointed. It's not about church. It's about a relationship with God. A church is a community of people that encourage each other in the relationship with God. But God is perfect. The church is not. God's not asking you to join a church. He's asking you to join him through his son. If you've never done that, today's your day of salvation. Maybe some of you used to walk with God, you're not walking anymore. Maybe you've never done it before. So I know how better to pray and also to help you in this process. I'm going to ask you to raise your hands. Say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Christ for the first time. Oh, I want to renew my commitment. I've fallen away. Thank you. Anyone else this morning? Thank you. Anyone else this morning? Anyone online? Okay, let's pray this prayer with our hearts to God Almighty. Repeat after me in your own heart. Lord Jesus... I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross and rose again from the dead. Today, I step down from being in charge of my life. I surrender to you. I ask you to take my life now. 
it is yours. I ask you to forgive me of everything I've ever done wrong, both known and unknown. I turn away from what I know is wrong and I turn to you. Thank you that I am your child now in Jesus' name. Amen. We, we believe you prayed that prayer. You began a relationship with Jesus Christ. In the front pocket of your seat or in the back, if you're sitting in the front, there is a card you can pull out. We want to help you in the journey. We're just a bunch of people. I, I, I'm on a journey. We're on a journey together. We're a community of people that are following Jesus. Jesus does not say, say a prayer goodbye. He says, come follow me. And what we're doing is following Christ. And so we want to encourage you to fill that out. Also, you can get your phones out and you can text BELIEVE to 860-499-4888. That's 860-499-4888. And you can go ahead and do that. Okay, everybody? Hey, listen, I want to encourage you with prayer. I want to encourage you to make it a priority in your life. I want to encourage you that God loves you and don't disdain. Maybe you're not a great prayer. Who cares? It's about your heart. There's more we're going to be talking about this in the coming weeks. It's such an important uh, practice that we get to have that Jesus spends a great deal of time with it. And we're going to look at it next week. And we're going to learn how to pray prayers that God hears and moves heaven and earth. Amen? Amen. Amen.